I did have some influences from people who culturally came from Birmingham, and I always felt, you know, Robert Plant, Led Zeppelin. The song that got me known is um, Love and Affection, which came out in 76. I just got him in the studio. I just said, you've got to come out and do some recordings. And the first song they, 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 they ever recorded was a song called King, which was a beautiful song. You know, I, I can't help but see Birmingham as the capital of this huge region. And bands from Wolverhampton, or Tamworth, or Litchfield, or, you know, they're, they're Birmingham bands. We're their, we're their capital city. Birmingham has never had the recognition it deserves for its contribution to contemporary popular music simply because of the variety that we have here. And that, for me, is what makes it an amazing place to live. Whether it be black music or rock music, whatever, the fact that there's great music coming out of, of Birmingham and what we were, as, as, as people from, from, from the Midlands felt, you know, we were the second city, we are the second city, and yet, there was still a struggle, you know? But there was some of the huge talent coming through. There has never ever, no matter what tribe people have tried to do, there has never ever been a Birmingham scene that has been visible to um, the, the outside world. And therefore, I think it's been a great sort of uh, fermenting, hot spot for uh, for artists of all kinds. It's very much part of our makeup, you know, the, the great music culture in Birmingham. I think, you know, Birmingham's produced some fantastic artists over the years. Look at the success Judas Priest have had in America, and Sabbath before them, Zeppelin. There is a lot of talent that comes from Birmingham, and we're forever hearing about Manchester, when actually, Birmingham, you know, pushed out the boundaries, not only musically, but with TV as well. We, we appreciated where we'd come from. We really knew that we'd come from a city that was, you know, heavy in culture and heavy in music culture, and so many great bands had come from there. We do all rub along quite well, you know, all these different yeah. sort of, you know, cultures, races, you know, all these different things that we're, we're all into. This place was just vibrant, it really, really was. Local Radio was a real kindergarten band in a way, and I can't remember half the guys were in it. Um, but there was Chris Wood who went to Traffic, uh, John Bonham who went, went to Led Zeppelin, um, Polly Palmer who played with a, went to Family and Family became something famous. Spooky Tooth uh, took um, Mike Kelly. We had Mike Burney, of course, as I mentioned, he went to into several of Roy Woods bands. Carl Palmer went to Emerson Lake and Palmer. Dave Pegg went to join. Fairports and later on Jethro Tull. But the greatest singer we have is a guy called uh, Danny King. Maybe, maybe the purest pop voice this country has ever produced. It's like Jackie Wilson. It always been a very, very, very musical band, playing lots of tough, straight ahead Kansas City jazz and swing. A really, a very musical band, and really hot soloists. Musically, everyone around here, Blondie Mo 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 was a was a really one of the bands you should aim to be like. We decided to form this little four-piece band and we I think we called ourselves the Rhythm and Blues Quartet or something. We used to play all around Birmingham and of course got very popular very, very quickly. I can't remember how we got bookings into the Golden Eagle on Hill Street, but we did. Of course, within two weeks, the queues were right down the street. For our show. I mean, it was extraordinary. We would turn up two hours before we were to play. There were people lined all the way down the street. It was extraordinary. Now Steve was still only 14. We went up to see Stevie Winwood, we'd heard about, and, I, and my brother had seen him playing in pubs at lunchtime in Birmingham in, in just four months. Uh, so my friends and I, we went up to St Paul's Youth Club, the hall of St Paul's Church on the Walsall Road. And we saw that was the very beginning of the Spencer Davis group. You know, Steve and I would play with the drummer behind Spencer and he would sing his blues songs with accompaniment from, 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 from our little jazz band. And uh, so we decided that uh, wouldn't it be a good idea if we did some rhythm and blues? They didn't do their own music, it's a George on my mind blues music and uh, 
It was fantastic. You never heard anything like it. So exciting. Of course, when we had two very good voices, Spencer had a very good voice at that time, <laughs> and uh, and Steve, who had was now developing an exceptional voice. You know, it was very easy to sound terrific. And Pete York was an ideal drummer for that kind of thing because he had a kind of, rather than a rock and roll drummer, he had a more shuffly beat, which was much more bluesy than the normal rock band drummers who played with other R&B bands. And our manager and recording manager was Chris Blackwell. And then Chris Blackwell wanted to change our name to the Rattlesnakes. And we didn't like that. I said, listen, Spencer is always our spokesman. He's got such a great name, Spencer Davis. We should call it the Spencer Davis Group. Then he can go and do all the publicity bits and we guys don't have to do anything except play, which was the sole reason for it. And, and the other two guys, Peter and Steve, were perfectly happy with that. So we called ourselves the Spencer Davis Group, not because Spencer was the leader, because he wasn't. None of us were. We were totally democratic but just because he had the best name and he was also a terrific speaker. And he was also older than the rest. I mean, Spencer was 10 years older than Steve. You know, you couldn't really tell that when you saw the band on stage in the 60s, but Spencer was 10 years older than Steve, five years older than me. I, I would say, um, for, from that period, he was our most famous son, if you like. I don't know how they put it. A lot of people know that he was one of the great artists, certainly of the 60s, but that's when he established his name and I think he's a very important figure, world figure. Really the Spencer Davis group was, was because of the inclinations of Pete York and Steve and myself really. And I know that after we, we did Keep On Running, I worked out the bass intro Somebody in the recording session, it might have been Blackwell, it might have been Spencer or Steve, said, try this new box. It was a box that Steve had, and he'd been playing little fuzzy things. And we put the bass in it. It didn't work so much live because it blew the speakers, but in a recording studio we could control the, uh, we could control the output. That's how we had a fuzz box bass. And then I noticed then that those fuzz boxes, as they got made later on in life, were always called big muffs. Groups and stuff were, were kind of a new thing, uh, I think, around that time. And uh, um, so there was no kind of uh, matrix to, to, to set yourself against or, 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 or compare yourself with. You know, every band seemed through coincidence or through design, whatever, someone had a, a room or, or a rendezvous place. You'd meet up and that became your headquarters. You know, we were just all kids hanging out, hanging out and, and kind of thrown together by this, this strange uh, musical thing we were involved in. The Alex's Pie Stand thing was just where we all used to end up in the middle of the night, coming back from the gig. Alex's Pie Stand was um, an iconic place in, in Birmingham. It sounds daft, but it really was. It was, where it was just, well, it's now a car park and some advertising hoardings, and it's where the, where the old Albany Hotel used to be. Wherever you'd been, whether you'd been you know, in North Birmingham, if you say, you say you've been working in Wolverhampton or something, or if you've been in, in Worcester or, or in Birmingham itself, you just, it was such a, a perfect place to meet up. You'd drive into Birmingham late at night, so around, probably around midnight, and there'd be all these group vans all parked up, and we'd all meet, and that's where the move really started to be put together. So that became a, a place where lots of deals were done and lots of groups, you know, uh, if somebody wanted to get somebody else in their group, that'd be like meeting them at Alex's or something. And deals would be done, uh, various things like that. And, and, and generally all the bands would just talk, you know, what songs you're doing these days and which girls you're dating and, you know, whatever. And, and it'd all get... And the food was delicious. These were these fabulous uh, fleur-de-lis pies. And you used to do great hot dogs. And that you couldn't have it, the only drink was hot, it was tea or coffee. And, and it was just a wonderful place to meet. And Johnny Prescott, the, who, the, the boxer who was very successful, British heavyweight champ, uh, another Birmingham guy, loved his music. He used to go to Axis Pie Stand and we loved it when he was there because he used to pay for everybody. Everything's on me because you you're making a few quid, you know. 
I, I mean, I benefited out of the the first uh, or one of the, the first kind of um, deals that were being done behind the scenes in terms of the, when the move were put together. Carl Wayne, who I didn't know at that time, but I, I knew him later. But at that uh, at that time, he went round. Uh, uh, kind of getting all the best people out of the groups. I you know, got Roy Wood out of Mike Sheridan's group, Trevor Burton out of Daniel King's group, Bev Bevan was in the Diplomats, I think he was, I'm not sure. Anyway, he, he got all these guys out of all these groups, they upset a lot of people doing it, in, in my level. But I benefited because then Trevor left Danny King. Danny King heard a record that I'd made down the studio, phoned me up, said, I want you in the band, I like you this record you made and I went to me in my band. So I was one of the ones who got pulled up to the next <clears throat> the next wrong because these other guys had moved on so. I didn't know at the time, uh, it was David Bowie. I was chatting to, uh, I think he was at the Cedar Club. He, chat, he was, and he got talking to Ace Kefford and Trevor Burton and said, well, you know, there's what, what you should do, because they were two very young guys. Trevor was only 17, Ace was probably 18 good-looking lads. He said, you know what, and David Bowie said, what you should do is, there's all these bands in Birmingham, just find the best people and put a, a band that looks good and can really play and get down to London and you're never going to make it here in Birmingham, get down to London and and, and do something. And that, so they actually started it. They, and they, invite, they asked Roy Wood first because they went out, because he was with Mike Sheridan and the Night Riders and Really good player, good singer. Uh, and then, and then it was me, and then it was Carl Wayne. We formed it in late '65, and then '66 we started uh, actually putting together our first gig. And there's a little plaque actually uh, on the wall. It was the Belfry, better known as a golf club now, but uh, there used to be a regular Monday night gig uh, at the Belfry. And the move uh, that was our first ever ever show. And then that same night we went on to uh, the Cedar Club in Birmingham, you know, it was a double header. Uh, and I met my wife the same night. I saw them first at the Cedar, and they were just, they were just terrific. I mean, Jeff Lee was just knocked out with, with, uh, with Roy and that, and he became friends with Roy. Jeff said to me, he's the best guitarist I've ever seen, you know, and, uh, and I mean, we used to just be uh, gobsmacked at the move, they were just great. Uh, I have to say, probably the best band I've, I've ever been in was the original Move, because uh, we were so keen and we could all play, and uh, and the energy level was incredible. So I think '66 and '67 were, were just brilliant. Roy Wood was put on the map by the Move, which came out of Carl Wayne's um, vision for for forming the Super Group. He was like an entrepreneur of the, of the music scene. You know, in, uh, in the way he put that group together and, and kind of uh, he, he knew what he, he was aiming at and it and he, he worked. Uh, Tony Blackburn was going to play on a launch Radio 1 with flowers in the rain because he liked the thunderstorm at the beginning. I think it was 7 o'clock in the morning. Radio One, first, the first ever show on Radio One, uh, and we were driving back from some, somewhere way up in Scotland or somewhere, and we were, we were actually still on the road at seven in the morning, coming back, and we pulled into a lay-by or, or a transport cafe or something uh, to listen to our to our record being the first one on Radio One. Then Ace Kevin had real problems. Uh, he took too much acid actually. That that was that didn't help. He took this great load of homemade acid, which is LSD, which is a really stupid thing to do. And he, and he, he was a fragile character anyway, and that sort of turned him over the edge. And it became impossible to work with, you know, as a sacking, basically, um, which was a shame. And then Trevor started to turn weird, because we, we just got to, we had our one and only number one, Blackberry Way, uh, 69, we're literally number one. And Trevor says, oh, I don't, oh, I don't, I'm leaving. You know, so we just, we, after all, we'd finally got number one and he left. Trevor had left the mood, Danny had left the Moody's. Now they're both in with me. 
And it looked like fate accompli. I, I think I'm pretty sure that uh, Tony Secunda had this agenda going. He looked at the individuals and he thought, he'll do, he'll do it. And he was looking to build a super group, of which I was a part, but he didn't consider the rest of the uglies to be part of it. One by one, he gave them all the sack. Unfortunately, there was always a conflict between Trevor and Denny because they both wanted to play lead guitar. And uh, they decided that they would share the share the guitar and share the bass playing. So there was always going to be that clash there. And then we could never sort of settle on a, on a drummer and we, we auditioned lots of different guys. Uh, we used to rehearse in a barn, but <laughs> we always chose to rehearse about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and you know, we, we'd get complaints from the local constabulary. <laughs> it was never a smooth, a smooth operation from the word go. It was fraught with uh, difficulty. So not, all, never all getting up at the same time, all going to bed at different times. There was a lot of stuff imbibed and, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, indulgence going on. And because there was an endless supply of um, revenue, because they uh, uh, Tony, Tony Secondary, signed a management deal with an American film company, you know, on the promise of this super group, with that kind of luxury. Uh, you, you would think there'd be no, nothing to prevent us, but it, it just didn't happen.